Couple of days ago, someone asked me, what do I do for a living? And generally, when someone who is not very familiar with tech industry, etc., asks me this question, my answer generally is, I work in tech, or some things along the lines of, I'm a software engineer. But this person was very keen to know that what I actually do. And he said, okay, what do you do in tech? And then I said, I'm working as a data scientist. And this person asked, okay, what is a data scientist? And I was paused for a moment because I couldn't articulate in a moment that what is data science. So I gave him some answer, but this is something I was thinking about lately as well, that what is data science? And how would I explain it to someone who has no idea what data science is? And also, how would I define data science, especially the role of data science has changed just so much in the last 10 years. So even people who are familiar with what data science term means, it is a little confusing in what it stands for, especially considering there are so many other data roles available. So in this video, around this topic, I wanted to share my thoughts with you based on my 10 plus years of experience working as a data scientist in the US tech industry. And some of the things I wanted to cover in this video are why we have data of everywhere, what is the power of this data, how do I see data scientists as mainly problem solvers, and why I think data science, AI, and machine learning, this is the future. So let's begin with the first point of why there is data everywhere. And I'll try to give an example which all of you are familiar with and it makes sense even if you have like no technical background. So let's start with an example of banking. And I've picked the banking sector example because pretty much everyone is familiar with banks and we have seen them throughout our lives. We have seen how they have evolved. And I also have experience not only working in the banks, but being a banking user for last so many years. And I have personally seen that how the banking industry has evolved over the period of time. For example, if we go back 30 years and around mid 1990s, when I used to go to banks with my father, even in big branches, I would not see a single computer there. So there were people with a lot of files and there were big filing cabinets and everything they do, it was manual and people were taking notes into the files. And even when you have to make a transaction, the whole process was very manual. Someone would look into how much money do you have in your bank account by looking into some manual file. And then the transaction you make also would be recorded in some file somewhere. So it was highly manual, a lot of paperwork oriented workflow. And this was not only in the banks that they didn't have any computers, pretty much all other record, especially around government organizations, it was all manual. And that's why we would see that if there is any fire incident or flooding incident, then all that record, all that precious record would just go away and there's no recovery method to that. And unfortunately, it is still true, especially around the government organizations in the developing countries, but particularly in the banking industry, we have seen that things have evolved a lot. So around 2000s, we saw that instead of just putting everything on a paper file, in a lot of companies and government organizations, they started using computers. And they mainly started using computers because the information is easy to put in, it is easy to retrieve, it is easy to search, but still the data was stored internally into the computer hard drives or some floppy disks or in the CDs. So though now the search functionality was there and you could keep these CDs in somewhere else and make copies of that, so there was an element of data replication, but still it was not a very efficient model. And then fast forward to 2010s, this was an era when we started having centralized servers. So for all the banks, they would have centralized servers somewhere where the data from all the banks would get together and then they had an element of redundancy and replication so that even if a data center is lost, there is the data is preserved somewhere else as well. And this is the pattern we had been seeing in a lot of organizations. And gradually what we're seeing is the price of computers is going down and the compute power of the computers or laptops or, or other such devices is just going up. For example, the supercomputer 
the big bank headquarters would have in the 1990s, our phones have much better compute power at a fraction of a cost, which everyone can afford. When I enrolled in the engineering university in 2005, the first computer which I got, it cost me 80,000 rupees in Pakistan back then, and it was a lot of money. And it was not a laptop, it was a full CPU. And if I compare it to today's smallest phones, that big computer still didn't had enough memory, didn't had enough hard drive space as the small phones today have. So clearly we have come a long way in terms of having much better compute power available to us in a fraction of a cost. And this led to a digital revolution. So if we go back to the example of a banking industry, now we are seeing that there are banks which are 100% digital. So we have come a long way starting 30 years back when we have just manual paperwork oriented banks to now all 100% digital banks. And this is very fascinating and very empowering. For example, when I was working in Wells Fargo around 2016, Wells Fargo around that time had about 240,000 full-time employees and about similar contract employees. They had in total had about 500,000 employees. Now you compare it against a digital bank, for example, Sophie. Sophie currently has about 5,500 employees and they have presence in a lot of countries. So compare it against something which is 480,000 and 55,000 orders of magnitude difference. And the best part is that this model is 100% scalable. So if the customer base of Sophie, it doubles overnight, they don't have to double their employee count, maybe 10%, 20% more, and that's it because most of these employees, they are software engineers. So the code which they have built, it just scales indefinitely. And this, I'm just talking about the employee cost. Now there are office space costs, cleaning costs, there are just so many other costs which these digital banks do not have. For example, again, when I was working in Wells Fargo in San Francisco, our team used to give $3,500 per month to the building department of the same bank to just get a space for a single person to sit in that office. From the bank's perspective, it is not only the salary of the person who is working, but the space in which they are working, its maintenance and security and all of that, it adds up. So of course, because of all these incentives to go digital, a lot of companies and banks, they are going digital. And this digital transformation is leading to a lot of data being generated. So when we talk about all the data which is getting generated, we can see that there is records data. So this is all the transactions you have made, all the pretty much things which were previously kept into the paper files. Now there is a digital copy of it in the centralized servers. So there is all that record data, but on top of that, now there is interaction data, which is also captured somewhere. For example, when I open my banking app in my phone, where I opened it, who opened it, what was the location, what was the device, all of that is captured somewhere. Similarly, when I call the bank, who called it, who answered, what was the interaction, what was the call duration, all of that is captured. If I go to a banking ATM and I withdraw some money, who withdraw it, from where, how much money was withdrawn, all of that data basically is captured also. And the interactions data is much bigger than records data. And what is even bigger is this device data. So a lot of banks and ATMs, they have their CCTV cameras. So that data is captured somewhere. Also, there are some continuous signals coming from ATM devices and other devices to make sure that they are in a good functioning conditions. And all of that device data, especially when you go to routers level, this is even much bigger. So this basically means that now we have so much data, which is just coming our way and we are basically drowning in the data. And so far intentionally, I was mainly giving the example of a banking industry, but this transformation into the digital, it applies everywhere. We have seen that how hospitals have evolved over time. As a child, when I used to go to the hospital, there was not a single computer in the entire hospital. Everything was paperwork oriented and doctors didn't even know how to use hospital. Nowadays, in the first world countries, especially when you go to a hospital, the nurse, the doctor, the receptionist, 
everyone is sitting in front of a computer. Whatever you're saying, they're looking into the information, into the computer, they're putting the information into the computer. Everything is digital. Even your diagnosis reports or the records which are sent to the pharmacy for you to get the medicine, that is not paperwork oriented also. So we are moving towards digital in all aspects of life, be it banking, be it hospitals, be it schools, universities, online shopping, everything is moving towards digital interactions. And that leads to data being generated in enormous amount with every passing day. So now we have seen that why we have so much data being created at every passing second. Now the next thing which I wanted to emphasize is that this data, it has enormous power. So we used to say knowledge is power. I think the modern day equivalent of that is data is power. So companies who have a lot of data and know how to intelligently use it, they are just going to crush the competition. So let's look at some examples. So we know that YouTube has a lot of content which is uploaded by a lot of people. And if we look at the statistics, 70% of the views on YouTube, they are not coming from someone who would knew this person and they want to know and they want to search for that particular topic and look at it, it is coming for recommendations. So 70% of the views on YouTube, they're coming from recommendations. And what is a recommendation? This is basically an intelligent way of using the data on what kind of things you watch and then showing you recommendations based on that. So this is an intelligent use of the data which is leading to 70% views on YouTube. Same thing for Netflix. In, so this is this number is a little old. In 2017, I'm pretty sure this has increased over time, but 80% of watched videos on Netflix, they are based on the recommendations. Similarly, we are seeing this in the shopping industry as well. For Amazon, 35% of the sales, they come from recommendations. So a lot of people, when they used to go to the shopping, when online shopping was not a thing, they would know this is what they have in mind and they would go and ask the shopkeeper that this is what the stuff they want to buy and they'll get it. But now 35% of the stuff, you don't ask for it. Amazon tells you, I think you would want it. And when you look at it, it just resonates with you and you want to buy it. So this is the power of intelligent use of data. And we have seen some extreme examples of it. So this is a little old story. In Feb, 2012, Target, which is a retail store in the US, they sent some baby coupons to a teenage girl. And when the father of that teenage girl saw that Target was sending some, some baby stuff related coupons to his daughter, he was very furious and angry that why is Target sending it? Because she was just a teenage unmarried girl. And when he tried to push back and ask the Target people that why they are sending her that stuff, Target basically responded that based on her buying history, they think that she's pregnant and she's going to have a baby. That's why they are sending her the baby stuff. And the father didn't know about that pregnancy, but Target did because of how they were collecting and analyzing the data they knew about that pregnancy even before the father of the girl did. And this is relatively new article where in King's College of London, they did an experiment that the AI diagnosis on x-rays is as accurate as doctors. And of course, if today it is as accurate as doctors, in the years to come, it will easily be even better than doctors. So this is just trying to give you an idea of that, why we have so much data, what are the possibilities we can have if we intelligently use this data. And the examples I shared are just few examples. There are just so many more examples in the marketing domain, in sales, in customer experience, pretty much every aspect of life, every aspect of a business, there are transformations which are possible if you collect the right data and you intelligently use it. And this is what I think the job of data scientist is. So my definition of data science is that data scientists are someone who help solve business problems using data. And there are three components of this definition. One, we have data. The second is that we have business problems. And the third is our ability to solve these business problems. And as we have seen that there is just so much data and there are just so many interesting problems which can be solved for the businesses. This is a big domain and data scientists are not 
the only people who are working on data to help solve these business problems. So there are some other roles available around it as well. And I wanted to briefly touch on the topic of that how data science basically fit in into this bigger data picture. How do they basically fall into the bigger data picture and how do they interact with other data roles? So this is basically a life cycle of a data science role. So there is a data warehouse where the data is stored. Then there are data pipelines which fetch the data. Then that data is analyzed. There are some AI ML models which are developed on top of it. And then those AI models are deployed somewhere else. And as we can see that there are different roles which are working in this. There is the role of data engineer, data analyst, data scientist, ML engineer. And an AI engineer, you can say, is also similar to the role of data scientist. So as we can see that data engineer mainly knows and tracks where the data is stored, develops pipelines so that the data gets there, and helps position it so that the data can be analyzed. Data analyst basically fetches those data and analyze it. Data scientists usually have the biggest scope in terms of getting the data from the pipelines all the ways to deploying those machine learning and AI pipelines and AI models. And machine learning engineers are basically advanced versions of data scientists whose breadth of work is not as vast, but they focus on the end of this life cycle and they just go a little more deep. So this is how data scientists usually fall into the bigger picture of other data roles. The next thing I wanted to quickly touch on is why I think that this data science, AI, and machine learning is the future. So we have already seen that there is data being generated as every component of our life is getting digital. All the industries, all our personal life things, they are getting more and more digital with every passing day. And as you can see that this growth of data, it is not linear, it is exponential. And if we continue to keep generating data at this extent, at this pace, there will of course be lots and lots of data into the future. And the other component is that our ability to process, to store, and compute that data is also increasing with every passing time. So this is a classical Moore's law graph. And Moore's law, what basically says that for every microchip, for example, if this is a microchip, the number of transistors in this microchip, they're going to double every two years with the same size and with the same price, roughly. So if this microchip is two inch by two inch, and the cost of this is $10, let's say, the number of transistors in it, they're going to double every two years. And when we look at the graph starting all the way from 1970 to 2020, this pattern almost holds true. And if it continues to hold true, and even if it is remotely close to being doubling every two years, that would mean that we would have enormous compute power in the future as well. Because to understand the power of doubling, a classical example which is given is that if you have a piece of paper, for example, if I have this piece of paper, it has pretty much no height, right? But if I double it, then it has slightly more height. They say if you double it 32 times, you can reach the height of that paper. It will be equivalent to the distance from the earth to the moon. And if you double it one more time, it will be the distance from the earth to the moon and then back. So this is what doubling means. So if something keeps doubling every two years, that means we are making enormous progress in it. And to quickly go back towards the definition of data science, if our data keeps doubling, if our ability to solve and store and compute that data keeps doubling and the business problems, of course, they will never end. We will. It, it, it's impossible that someday we'll say we have solved all the problems and now we can just, we don't have any more problems. The problems will always be there. It's just that the smaller problems, the easier problems will be maybe handled by the machines. And we humans would have to work on more interesting and much more difficult to solve problems. So the problems are going to go up, the data is going to go up, the, our ability to solve with the help of computers is going to go up. And that is why I think the role of data science, it is only going to grow much more as we go into the future. Now, if you're interested in becoming a data scientist, I have this detailed roadmap video, it's 40 minutes long, where I've covered in detail where you need to start with, 
What are the topics you have to cover from where you have to cover it? I've analyzed and looked into some actual job listing for junior data science roles and have gone through it in detail. All of that material is in this video. I'm pretty sure you'll like it. Thank you so much for watching.